This is uh, week two of a message uh, that uh, last week I titled the message, Superman's Not Coming. Sorry, Superman's Not Coming, and the Transformers are a toy, and the Marvel series is a comic book story. Uh, Superman's not coming, but the Holy Spirit is here. Oh, well. Uh, the Holy Spirit, say, look at your neighbor and say, the Holy Spirit is here. I mean, you know, he's kind of that guy that hangs out in the corner of your heart uh, 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 until you invite him to say something. Then when you do, never mind. So, so I, I'm going to go back and read Onis, Onesimus. Uh, Onesimus is uh, written twice in the Bible uh, in the book of Colossians, one verse, and then the whole letter of Philemon, which is one chapter, uh, is about Paul writing to Philemon, and Philemon is the bishop of Colossae, and Onesimus is a fugitive thief that has run away from home, and uh, Paul is going to write in his handwriting, he says, uh, this letter trying to help Onesimus. Say it with me, Onesimus. I'm praying that God sends us all kinds of Onesimuses. Never mind. The, the, only, the only prayer I know that God has never stopped answering is the one when I asked the Lord to send me people nobody else wanted. That's how you got here. <laughs> eh, no, don't look around too much, but hey, Aaron, I love that guy. That guy is awesome. So if you haven't met Aaron, you ought to meet Aaron, right? So Philemon, verse 8, therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. I could. Paul said, I could. I, I could. I got the authority. I could order you to do what you ought to do. Yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. Look at your neighbor and say, on the basis of love. <laughs> I got the authority, but I'm not going to use the authority. I'm going to lean into your understanding of love. It is none other than I, Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, that I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus. He's my son, who became my son while I was in prison. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he's become useful both to you and to me. He, he wasn't worth a dime. That boy wasn't worth a plug nickel. He, he was, have you ever met somebody that just wasn't worth anything? They, they didn't even make good slave. I mean, it, I, he was worthless, but now, say now, Onesimus means useful. Onesimus means useful. I, I am sending him who is my very heart. I mean, he, he starts out by saying he's my son. Now he says, this is my heart back to you. I would have liked to have kept him with me so that you could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent. I, I could have ordered you, but then you'd have done it because I ordered you. But I, I want this to be your choice. I want this to be your choice uh, so that any favor that you might do for him would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated for you for a little while was that he might, you might have him back forever. No longer a slave, but better than a slave. Hmm. A dear brother, he is very dear to me, even dearer to you. I already know he's important, but he's more important to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, a friend, welcome him as you would welcome me. He has done you, if he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I'll pay it back, not to mention that you really owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit. The, the translation I really like says, do this so that I would have joy. Refresh my heart in Christ. I am confident of your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. On the basis of love, on the basis of our love for God and God's love for us, on the basis of your love for me, you see, the kingdom of God will only operate in an atmosphere of unconditional, undeserved love. If we really want to experience all that God has for us, we have to have a culture of that kind of love. This is my son, my very heart. He was useless, but now he's useful. There's a transformation that has taken place. I don't want to force you. I want it to be as an extension of your own favor. Listen to me. I'm approaching you not on the basis of slavery. I'm moving beyond slavery. I'm not even, not even going to pay attention to the culture of this world. We have a culture that comes from heaven, and I'm appealing to you. If you're a partner, if you're a friend to me, 
I want you to receive him like you would receive me. If I were to walk in the house tomorrow, however you would treat me, I want you to treat, can you, can you catch this? I want you to take this runaway slave and treat him like the Apostle Paul. I want you to treat this thief, this good-for-nothing, useless fugitive. When you read this letter, I want, to ch- I want you to change the way you're looking at him. You've got to understand, he sealed that letter, handed it to Onesimus and said, deliver this. Onesimus had never read the letter. He didn't know what the letter said. He has to trust, he had to trust Paul. He had to trust Philemon. But in the reading of the letter, Philemon changes his mind. The appeal of one friend to another friend changes the mind of the friend. And 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 at one moment, Onesimus is probably on his knees waiting for the decree from Philemon. But in the next moment, Onesimus is being washed and probably re-robed and seated at the table. Maybe it's the same chair Mephibosheth sat in. You have to understand that in the reading of this letter, I want you to change the way you're treating this slave that owes you a lot. Wow, what a letter. I got one of them letters. You got one of them letters? I have one of them letters. It's in my heart. And when I get to heaven, Christ has written that letter, and the Father's going to open. Oh, well, I got I to gotta back up. If he's wronged you of any way, I'll pay it back. Can you hear the theology of Christ paid a debt I could not pay? That Christ is the one. He goes, I've... And do this so that I'll have joy. The way you receive Onesimus will bring me joy. When you treat other people the way you would treat me, it will bring me joy. Joy is not in what you acquire. It's not even the circumstances in which you live. But when I hear that you're loving Onesimus, I will have joy. When I hear that you've received this individual that has wronged you and you give him a place at your table, I will have joy because you treated this sinner with kindness. I will have joy when you treat this person that wronged you with goodness. Am I making any sense? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This is the gospel in action. I want you to put what you believe into action. This is a moment, Philemon, where it doesn't matter what you believe. It matters how you treat this slave and this thief and this beggar and this good for nothing. It matters how you treat the people that hurt you. It matters. You don't return evil for evil. You turn the other cheek. You restore them even undeservedly because I asked you to. On the basis of our relationship, I'm sending this one to you. Man. Oh, and by the way, I trust you'll do it. You'll do even more than I ask. So even what Paul asked, Philemon's going to do above and beyond. See, the title of this sermon is, it's not what you know. It's who you know. At the end of the day, all you intellectual Bible scholars out there that pick apart everything I say, I want you to know it's not what you know. It's who you know. I have news for you. I know Jesus. And Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, forgives sinners, elevates the lost, restores the least, welcomes tax collectors. He sits with the people that other people will have nothing to do with. He loves people that you've deemed unredeemable. Oh, my God. Somebody in this room is going, that's me. (laughs) You see, Friendship, not doctrine, is what saved Onesimus. Friendship, not rules, not regulations, not bylaws, not moral ability. No, you see, Onesimus had heard of Paul. Onesimus might have even seen Paul interact with Philemon. And Onesimus runs away from Philemon, but he had to find Paul. And you didn't find Paul on television. You didn't find Paul in a meeting. He was in a church. He was in jail. And Onesimus went, a runaway slave went to a jail. That's not smart. If you got a bounty on your head, you don't go to the jail because they might figure out who you are. 
Onesimus put all of his faith in the relationship that he had seen exist between Philemon and Paul. His trust was in the revelation of the love and the friendship between these two. And he went to Paul seeking a favor. He trusted in their friendship to benefit him. You know what I trusted today? The relationship that the father has with the son and the son has with the father. I trust that when Jesus said, forgive him, father, that the father does. I trust in the relationship that exists in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I trust in what they have promised to one another. I trust in their righteousness. This story reveals a whole new culture, a whole new way of living, a whole new way of being. It reveals a whole order that follows after what Jesus said when he said, I have called you friends. I've chosen you. I've appointed you. I, 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 I want you to love one another. That, that he didn't call us brothers or sisters. He called us friends. You see, friends are greater than brothers. Brothers at least share some sort of biological connection. But friends don't necessarily share the bloodline of one another. You, if you don't know it, family is kind of thrust on you. If you live long enough, you'll understand what I mean by that. Just wait till Thanksgiving. You'll know exactly what I... They always show up at Thanksgiving or Christmas, you know. Are they coming? Yeah, I think they're coming. How do we not invite? Anyway, but friends are a choice. Friends, there's no biological responsibility, but it's a choice. And Jesus shows up and says, I call you friends. I've called you to love one another as I have loved you. Greater love have no man than this. Then he give his life for another man. That, that, that he considers someone else more important than himself. The essence of Christianity has very little to do with your rules or your moral concepts or your regulations. God did not send or leave a book. He left people who loved one another. He left People that were befriending of one another. He left friends who revealed the divine love of God. You see, friendship reveals that love that has been freely given. Today, there's some estimates of 40,000. I I can account for somewhere around 33,000 different denominations of the same faith. That's crazy. And then we wonder why we can't get ourselves to elect somebody Listen, as long as the church remains divided, so will the world. Amen. As long as the church keeps arguing with herself, what do you expect the world to do but to follow suit? The church was never intended to be splintered across in 33 different denominations or ideas or jump up and do what I think God revealed to me. That's called Gnosticism. It's not the faith. The definition today of the Christian faith, the essence of the Christian faith is not your creed. It's not your moral majority. It's not the way you worship. It's not the building or the denomination or the guy that you follow. That has nothing to do with the essence, the foundation of the faith. The faith is a relationship. The faith is a relationship that was given to us, not by the work of ourselves. Uh, Anybody know who Dietrich Bonhoeffer was? Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a great uh, man of God. He was martyred in 1944, July of 1944, somewhere in that era. And, And he wrote this, Jesus didn't come to call you to a new religion. He came to call you to life. Jesus didn't come to call you to a new religion. He came to call you to life. I've come that you might have life. Say life. And life abundantly, that you might enjoy that life. Can I tell you that 33,297 of those denominations are on to take all the joy there is out of it? (laughs) Jesus came to call us to a life, a life that is the results of him loving us. Life that's the results of his having chosen to love us while we were yet sinners. God, who is rich in mercy, we're in the love he loved us, in order to show us his great generosity, gave us salvation as a free gift. This is not a work of your own, but it's a gift. It's free. It's free. It's free. God chose the sinner. And, and some of you need to realize, never mind. 
Say with me, it's free. I get to live in this gift that God has given to me, not because of what I have or haven't done, but because he chose me to live in relationship with him. And the only thing I know to do is trust it. That's all I know to do. Hey, Abraham. You remember that guy, Abraham? He was called the friend of God. Uh, Hebrews 11 says he was the friend of God. It says he believed God and it was accounted in him as righteousness. And thus God considered him a friend. And, and the Bible says that God called Abraham. And Abraham had to get up and go out into a world that he didn't know where he was going. That's how I felt when I got saved. And I'm very serious. I didn't get saved because I understood anything. Uh, oh, well, maybe you did. Maybe you read the accordance, and then you got saved. I don't know. I, 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 I thank God they came up with an electronic version because then I can search for it because that book was, I didn't understand it. I started a relationship with Jesus far before I understood anything. Today, 50 years later, I might understand a little bit, but, but I had to get up and start walking with God and trusting in the God that called me as the God that would reveal himself and make himself known to me as we walk through this life. Am I making any sense? Abraham got up and went and just started walking with God, believing and trusting that God, he hoped above hope. He hoped beyond all hope. I mean, he kept believing when he was 100 he was going to have a kid. That's stupid. <laughs> I can, never mind. See, real faith trusts in the relationship more than in the world that's around you. And, and Isaiah says, the descendants of Abraham, all of you that are descendants of Abraham, fear not. For I am with you. Fear not, because I'll be with you wherever you go. Not because you're so much, but because I promised your great, 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 great granddaddy that his children would be included in this faith that he exercised. Amen. He exercised. Listen, I got Cindy, because Cindy knows. She's exercised faith, and so her kids don't have much choice. You didn't hear me. Cindy's exercised. Hey, Carol, how are you doing, honey? Didn't even see you sitting there until right now. You feeling okay? I'll remember where I'm at. Just put a mark right there. Carol has been ill, and she's doing better, and she walked in here. That means God's good. And we need Cindy knows that, 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 that if you raise up children in the knowledge that God has chosen them, they can chase all kinds of rabbits, but eventually... See, I didn't get saved because I understood this. I got saved because I saw grandmother loving Jesus and Jesus loving grandmother. I, I came to faith not because we were Pentecostal, but because my grandmother loved me. And, and, and she knew too much about me to love me, so it had to be God that was... <laughs> Listen, if your wife still loves you after 40 years, you ought to hug that woman. <laughs> it goes both ways. I... I it, <laughs> I, could, I could jump around here. Uh, see, see, relationship, that's what brings us. The Christian faith is, is, is not merely individualistic. The minute I came into a relationship with Jesus, I discovered there were others there. You see, Christianity can't be lived alone. Christianity can't be lived in your own idea of who God is. Christianity is a great big family. And it's filled with Onesimuses. Onesimuses. Say that. Onesimuses. It's filled with people that are runaway slaves. Filled with fugitives. Who, who, see, the relationship that the disciples had with one another were just as important as the one they had with Jesus. Because the relationship that the disciples had with one another revealed that they were followers of Christ. Jesus said, listen, I've called you friends. Now you love one another because the relationship you have with one another will be a witness to the world that I am who I said I was. Amen. That's why 33,000 denominations or judgments among fellow believers is not of God. That's why I will spend the rest of my life continually saying, we got to put this stuff to rest. You understand? You, you, you can't be arguing as believers whether or not someone is because they've gone to this church or that group or this group or that group. This has to be, we are all saved by grace, and this is a gift from God, and it's because of his mercy for us. And if you're in, I'm in, and if we're in, you're my friend. Because it's not about Jews or Greeks or slave or free or male or female. It's about this lived-out reality of love that now is permeating through our, see, Christianity in essence 
is friendship with God that is equated and seen as friendship with one another. Hmm. Onesimus knew nothing, but he saw the friendship between these two. And it was the friendship between those two that drew him to Paul. And it was his relationship with Paul that would reconcile him to, to Philemon. And this letter is written, I think, to remind us that friendships are the sacrament of the presence of God. Let me say it again. Baptism is certainly the way we enter, right? Right? Scriptures are the way we continue to discover. Amen. And the table is how we continually are fed, knowing that he is still with us. But can I tell you, it is your relationships that will continually reveal Christ to you. And if you are poor today, it's because you have judged other people not worthy to be your friends. Our challenge in the 21st century is not to build better churches, create more church growth programs. It's to love one another more easily, more frequently, better, if you will. To live like each person is important. Listen, I know a friend who loves at all times, the proverb writer says. He, he is a friend that's closer than a brother. This, this real friendship, according to Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle and Cicero, I, I can quote all of them, says that friendship is what makes you happy. Can I tell you that the happiest moments of my life are sharing life with a friend, someone that knows me and yet loves me. Sometimes that's your spouse. Sometimes that's hard to balance because of the whole sexual connotations that go in there. But, but real friendship is what brings joy. If you'll receive Onesimus, it'll give me joy. If, if, you'll, if you'll treat another the way you treat me, that will give me this strength and this joy. It, it is, hmm, this fellowship. St. John says that this shared life among believers is the source of all of our joy. One of the reasons why the world and the church particularly is having trouble with joy is they've allowed Facebook to define friendship. Well, I like that one, and I dislike that one, and I'll block this one. See, this isn't about what they can do for you. This is about what I can do for them. Real friendship is about what I can give to you, not what... I have people all the time. I, I listen, I've passed you long enough. I'm old enough. I've got enough gray. And uh, I've lost this. This has turned white. Uh, so I really don't care. Well, you know, this place doesn't meet my needs. The church is not Target. Amen. The church is not Walmart. Amen. This is not a place for you to determine whether or not we are providing a product that meets your needs. You're supposed to have walked here this morning having brought something with you. Oh, you didn't get any of that. Where are you giving? Who are you giving in your life? To whom are you giving to? To where are you investing? To, to where Paul was giving to Onesimus. He is willing to pay for it. Listen, friendship is not about seeking out other people who can bless us or fill us up. Friendship is about seeking other people who we can fill. Amen. It's not what you know. It's who you know. Okay. I've written about this, talked about it, and yet somewhere this summer the Lord began to speak to me about the fall. He began to speak to me very clearly about us, just here, uh, just within these walls and us as a community called the Father's House. I, I truly believe that if we can create a culture that is honored in this relational reality and not a part of what the church historically has made it in the last couple of hundred years, we could change the world. Amen. We literally, I spend my life today making friends. Every day. I get up every day. I, I, <laughs> Christy, I get up every day and walk into somebody's life. I do not know them. I do not know them. But I'm walking into every one of them as though they're my friend, because they are. And trying in some way to connect with them in any fashion, on any level. And can I tell you, have you ever met people that really were useless? I've met a lot of useless people. But they're only useless as long as I keep saying it. 
But if I have the ability to change the way I talk about them, hmm. You just keep talking about people that are not your preference, that are not the way you want them to be, and they will remain forever stuck in that. But if you can see through the uselessness and find the lion that's on the inside, and my connecting dots, listen, you don't want to come to this church and come once. You need to come at least six times or you won't even have a clue who I am or who we are. And then you better, make, you better sit down and stay for a year because I, listen, you got to look through the uselessness in order to find the Christ that's within. Amen. So here's, here's four or five little points. How could we change Hutchinson, Kansas? How could you change yourself? This is maybe how to change yourself. Number one, friendship is a choice. Say it's a choice. And it's not yours. It's his. Did you know nothing you do will ever change his choice about you? And that when he chose you, he didn't reject other people. Now, I'm going to be real blunt here for a minute towards a certain theology that I know exists in town, that some are chosen, some are not, that some are destined and some are not. God chose humanity. He chose every one of you. He elected all of you. That other thing is a lie to make people feel good about themselves. Listen to me. When God chose me, he did not reject you. And when he chose you, he did not reject me. This is not kickball. I was raised. We didn't even have, uh, this morning I talked about volleyball. We were so poor and every we couldn't afford the net. So we played. You didn't get it. Listen, when they chose me, they, they, they rejected her. And when they chose that, they rejected. Have you ever been the last man standing? I wasn't even good at kickball. <laughs> I wouldn't, you know, we had these old, do they have them now, these old red balls, and they throw them, they put you against, probably abuse now. We used to put them against the wall, and you threw the red ball, and we called it dodgeball. They probably don't let you do it anymore because somebody gets... <laughs> What they call abuse, we call fun. Uh, <laughs> unless you're the object. Uh, see, when God chose you, he didn't reject anybody, and he chose everybody. He chose humanity. Friendship is a choice, and it's his. And your responsibility is to receive the choice. Just to receive the choice. Uh, I'm chosen. Look at somebody say, I'm chosen. Uh -uh. He chose me to have life. He chose me to have eternal life, an abundant life, more than enough, greater than, above and beyond. He chose me to be successful, to win, to be a genius, to be the head and not the tail. Not because I pulled myself up by the bootstraps, but because he pulled me out of hell. Yeah. It wasn't that I had anything to do with this. He reached down and plucked me out of the miry clay. For, and listen, I can go biblical. And... And sat my feet on a solid rock. And I'm the head, not the tail, above and not below. Not because of what I did or the denomination, the right thinking or my morality, but because he just saw me drowning in my sin and ripped me up and made me alive with him and seated me in heavenly places with Christ. I'm his choice and so are you. Hmm. <sighs> okay. I was in the baby part this week. I don't get to go there very often, but I was in the baby part this week, and I noticed something. When they, when they, they hold up that baby, and they pat, or they rub, or they something, you know what, you, you know what that baby does? <gasps> breathe. Come on, breathe. Get this. You, you, do you know the difference between life and death? Breath. Breath. <gasps> Did you know the response to being born was the baby? Breathe. Can I tell you something, Christian? The way to receive the choice of God is to breathe in the spiritual life of God. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe? Come on, you need to breathe in this new life that's fresh and that's new. And you didn't deserve anything to do it. We just slapped you on the butt and you went, Ooh. When I got born again, it had nothing to do with me repeating a prayer or doing anything anybody wanted. All of a sudden, I knew God loved me on a little house in Eureka, Kansas, sitting watching a football game. And I realized God loved me, and I breathed in life for the first time. And I was alive in Christ, and the old was gone, and the new had come. And I knew absolutely nothing, but I was alive. Yeah. 
And she was a disciple of Christ. I was a backslidden, maybe never, but I don't know what I was. And he was a Lutheran, and I had a drink in this hand, and I had a football game on that hand. But when I breathed in, I knew God chose me. You know what you need to do in response to his choice? Breathe. Go ahead, breathe in. Thank you, God, for life. And breathe out. Now, can I tell you something? You're still stupid. You don't know anything, but you're alive. You're alive. You're alive. And he's in you. And you'll spend the rest of your life trying to figure it out. And some days will be good and some days will be bad, but don't listen to the religious people that are judging the bad days. Just go ahead and keep breathing. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I don't know why I'm, say with me, I'm chosen. And if I'm chosen, then every one of you are chosen. And he sat with the tax collectors and the sinners. He chooses those way out there. Listen, he chooses the people that we're trying to figure out whether or not we can serve them communion or not. It's interesting to me how some denominations restrict who can get communion. And Jesus is just skipping out, taking communion to the people that we just think are sinners. He's just skipping out around the edges going, well, while you're arguing about it, I'll deliver it to them. If I'm chosen and if you're chosen, then every sinner is chosen. Well, I can't go there because there might be sinners there. Good! I'm trying to tell you, some of the best conversations I ever had were in bars. You're not listening to a thing. Now you're going. I find that the best ground to witness to people is where sinners gather. Sometimes it's church. Uh, Say with me, it's a choice. And and can I tell you, number two, every friendship begins with a conversation. Every friendship starts with, hi, how are you? Hello, friend. Every conversation, I don't know if I can talk to him. Yeah, but did you know that John chapter 16 says, it's to your advantage that if I go away, because if I go away, I will send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Advocate, depending on what translation you like, to you. And he will teach you all things, bring all things to your memory. He'll take what is mine, make it known unto you. But the best translation of he'll send the helper to you is the word he'll send the friend to you. Do you know that the one that said I chose you to be a friend will now move on the inside of you and that friend will be in you. And through you that friend wants to befriend the world by starting up a conversation with other people. When's the last time you just looked at somebody and said hello friend? Oh, you did. Do you know our job down here is to befriend the world on behalf of Jesus? Our reality down here is to befriend the world on behalf of Jesus. That's your purpose. That's your calling. If you don't do that, you're wasting space. Because you're supposed to be befriending other people on the behalf of Jesus. He spoke and the world started. He's called Abraham, and he went. He spoke to Moses out of a bush. Everything begins with a conversation, a word. You can speak a word to people and give them life. Too much of the body of Christ the last number of years has been speaking bad words about people rather than speaking good words about people. It's a choice. And if it's a choice, it begins with a conversation. And when the conversation begins, can I tell you something? You'll begin to connect with that person. I look for ways of making connections with people. I walked into a guy, and, and listen, I better stop. He loved, he loved OU football. I had him. I'm born from Oklahoma. I know Oklahoma football. I said, do you remember where you were at 1971 on Thanksgiving Day? He says, I sure do. He said, that was the day that that kid from Nebraska broke the back of OU and destroyed our winning season. I had to stop. He said, do you remember when you, where you were at September the 10th, 1982? I thought, oh, I don't have a clue where I was at. <laughs> I didn't matter. I already had him. 
See, we need to seek to make connections with people. Because when we find connections with people, when we find something common, I don't care whether it's OU football or... It'll lead to Christ. Because in that conversation, they'll know that I care. And in that conversation of care... See, a number of years ago... I became friends with a guy that wears white all the time. And I became friends with a guy not because I really knew him very well, but because I had a friend by the name of Tony. And Tony knew him, and I knew Tony, and I was really good friends with Tony. And when Tony died, two of us were trying to find a way to console our grief with one another. And so I got to meet him. I got to spend time with him. You know, it it ticked off this group over here, and it ticked off that group over there. Just because we were friends. But can I tell you something? If you'll run the risk of befriending people that God sends into your life, it'll open up a realm for you that you don't know anything about. It's a choice. It's a risk at conversation. And it's a risk at connection. Can I tell you something? I'd have joined I mean, if you've never been there, you haven't got a clue what I'm talking about. But they walk you through the Santa Marta, and they walk you down, and they come up, and you're staring off the stage at St. Peter's. And you're, I mean, you know, it's just, it's mesmerizing. And I, I was like, where do I sign? And my friend looked at me and goes, well, why would you do that? We're already brothers by baptism. We're already friends. You see, the world will know about Jesus by the way we befriend people. Even people that don't agree with us doctrinally. Even with people that practice it differently than we practice. Even with people that have different social constructs than we have. Because it's not about any of that. It's about whether or not we can accept their chosenness, live in a conversation with them, and make whatever connections we can with each other. If we do, we can change the world. So Father's house, who are you connecting to? Who are you relating to? Who is it that God brings across your path that you could find something in common with and you could affirm to them that they are the chosen of God? You could connect with them in a way that would change their view about what the 33,297 groups have to say about him. Because it's our way we treat people that will cause Onesimus to come and find Paul. It's the way we treat one another that will change the world because the essence of Christianity is found in our friends and in our friendship. It's highly important that we begin to love other people the way we declare that he loves us. And in that connection, it will affirm or confirm our identity. In Umbutu or in Lakota, there is no pronoun for me or I. Only us and we. In Umbutu or Lakota, there is this word that means I am because we are. My existence is the result of my relationship with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives inside of me. And the confirmation of that is when I recognize that my identity is found in my relationship with you or with you within this community. Whatever's happening in my life in my 60s is a result that I truly believe that every human being I meet is a child of God. Every one of them is worthy of me declaring to them, you're loved, you're precious, you're useful, you matter. You valued. And if I can but for a moment become the sacrament of the Christ and allow him to flow through me for just a moment, I think I could change the world. I really do. I believe you can too. I believe the people you go to work with that you hate, you have an opportunity to change their lives. I believe the people that you have judged unworthy of being a Christian have the opportunity of being touched by you. I don't believe that this is the norm 
in every gathering this morning in Hutchinson, Kansas. In fact, I believe it's rather radical. And I, I think we're called to love those that even differ with me in opinion. Am I making any sense? And so, I'm trying to unleash the Father's house. I'm trying to unleash you into the reality that the greatest testimony that Christ has risen is the way we treat each other and the way we treat others. And that we ought to risk choosing who he chose. We ought to risk being in conversation with all of them. And we ought to be connected to as many as possible. In doing that, then the church becomes the display of relationships that we have with one another. Not a building, not our, but a group of people. And my prayer is that the Onesimuses of Reno County would search us out and find us and ask us to write a letter on their behalf. Am I making any sense? If you haven't figured it out or not, I have intent here. And that intent is, who are you thinking of right now? It's very simple. Who's somebody that's coming across your mind that you could work at having a conversation with? Who's, who's, who's somebody that you could try to find a connection with? You know they're in a bit of trouble. You know that. Who is it? That's the work of evangelism. That's the work of the church. Not just to come and get my needs met, but to go into all the world and befriend every soul. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray that people in our community would see us loving each other. I pray that we would see you in every soul in this county, all 80,000 of them that we would be intentional this morning about leaving here and revealing their chosenness to themselves, conversing with them, connecting with them. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, stand with me.